The, um, a number of weeks ago, this is pretty neat. I, uh, I had this Zoom interview, very brilliant man. And I was asking him different questions and he was, he was an academic and I thought it was going to take about an hour. And then I had, I had, I had wanted to spend some more time with the Lord, uh, that, that afternoon at a window there. So kind of was thinking about the rest of the day and, but it went long and I was just letting him talk because I was learning so much. And it was kind of like a hush after he finished giving me all his insight. And I said, man, I, I'm not going to have time for the worship. I plan to do this afternoon. And the Lord spoke to me, goes, what you just did was an act of worship unto me. Everything we, can, everything we do, if it's in step with the Lord, can be an act of worship unto the Lord. Do you live with a sense that you're building a generational legacy in the earth? Do you live with that sense? Are you stewarding? This is the next thing you see. Look at uh, look at Genesis 2. Here, we'll look at a few things and we'll land the plane here in a minute. Have you gotten something out of this morning? Yes. Okay. You're an attentive bunch. Thank you. Look at verse 6 of Genesis 2. I'm reading out of... Um, MEB translation. But a mist, oh, let me, let's start in actually verse four, be better, give us greater context. In that day, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. No shrub of the field was yet to, uh, yet on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Notice that God does not allow any growth until man is put there. But a mist arose from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord formed, formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in the east, and there he placed the man in who we had formed. Notice he doesn't allow any growth until he puts man in it. So here's another responsibility that, that applies to us today. The first thing before Adam begins to extend the kingdom of God on the earth. The first thing he had to do was to steward what was already there. Are you stewarding correctly the things in your hand? Are you stewarding correctly the things in your hand? Sometimes people, you know, they just got born again or they're just starting on this journey of walking with the Lord. Like, I don't know what to do. I said, whatever is in your hand right now, do it well and do it unto the Lord. Well, I want to, like, the Lord told me I got to go preach. That's awesome. I'm excited. You probably are. But don't quit your job quite yet. Unless the Lord tells you. But I don't think he's told you. So here's what you need to do. First thing you probably need to do is maybe go in and repent to your boss because you haven't showed up on time for the last two years, most of the time. And begin to become the best employee you can be at what God's called you to do. So are you stewarding the things that the Lord has given you? Are you stewarding the thing? Is, is this body, is this group of people, are you stewarding what God has given you? Because that is the place and that's the foundation to grow in the things of the Lord. Now you'll notice something else. Look at uh, 2 verse 10. A, a river flowed out of Eden to the garden and from it parted and became four rivers. And the name of the first is Pishon and encompassed the whole land. And Havilah, there is gold. The gold of that land is good, bedlam, onyx, and stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon and encompasses the whole of the land. And the name of the third river is Tigris. It goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth is the river Euphrates. The reason I, 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 uh, I read that is you'll see that God, in creating the earth, puts part of heaven in the earth and then gives man the commission to extend heaven on earth. Why do I read that? How do we know that's in heaven? Why? Read 
Revelation. If you're Pentecostal, you say revelations, but it's revelation. <laughs> and it's not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and where else do we know is gold? In heaven. He said there'll be gold streets. So what does he do? He puts heaven on earth, but here's the important part to us. The, 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 the establishment of the colony of earth to be like heaven was not fully completed. And guess who has a responsibility to do that? We do. We will land the plane here. Verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to man to see what he would call them. Whatever man called every living creature, that was his name. And the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Also earlier, he tells them, what does he tell them? Here's another part of you relating to God correctly. You were created for transformation and you were created to receive knowledge. My people are destroyed. What? what? For a lack of knowledge. There, it's not just, not just an intellect. It's not just knowing something. It's prophetic insight. So that without prophetic insight, the people of God perish. Man could not discover what he was called to be. He couldn't look in the mirror. Couldn't go, oh, I'm supposed to rule the earth. How did he have to know? Revelation knowledge. Only God could tell man what he was supposed to do. Only God could tell man his purpose. So you were created to receive information and knowledge from two different sources. Revelation knowledge. That's why Paul prayed for revelation. And by the way, you don't think from here, you think from here. The heart is the center of all things. Really, really important. Your mind and your beliefs only do what your heart believes. Your behavior is a result of what you believe. Your behavior is a result of what you believe. So that's why walking with the Lord is a great journey. Because uh, maybe you said something you shouldn't say to someone. And um, when you repent, you should probably just tell them, I'm sorry that you know what I really think about you now. <laughs> it's not right, but I'm repenting of it. Because if it came out, it's what you really think. <laughs> it's like people that I have a dance in my heart. Well, if it was in your heart, we would see it in your feet. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord knows my heart. Well, that's why he wants to change your heart, because he knows it. How do we know this? You've heard it said, if you commit adultery, you commit adultery. But I say to you, if a man looks, where does he, in his heart, to lust after a woman, he's already sinned. Because he knows it's in your heart, unless you change your mind, you're going to do it. As a man thinks where? Not in his intellect, but in his heart. So is he. Guard your heart with all diligence. Heart's a big deal. So you're created to, re how, how are you transformed? By, by your understanding from God. How did it come? Through relationship with God. You were created for eternal relationship with God. So he told them his purpose. And then what did he also tell them? He gave them an additional instruction. Don't eat from that tree. Which also tells us God doesn't tell us everything we need to know in one moment of time. Even our understanding of truth grows as we practice that truth. How many know I can believe? Or I can shout, Jesus is a healer. But until I practice that truth, I know very little about that truth. So now he's learning. The other place he received information is the five senses. Just like God, you're a, you have three parts to you. 
You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You have a body. Your body is not bad. Your body is not bad. I know a lot of people, I have my stupid flesh. No, they're all supposed to operate together as one. How do we know? Why do we believe God for healing? Part of the reason we believe God for healing is if your body is out of alignment, it's really difficult to even obey God. So your body's not bad. In fact, you're not led by your body, but when you grow in these things, the writer of Hebrews actually says, when your senses, he actually says your physical senses, when they're fully trained, they can discern both good and evil. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? It's a little different than your flesh is bad. Flesh is not bad. Your flesh is neutral. Your body will only do what it believes. That's why you got to believe differently. You're not led by your senses. You're led by the Holy Spirit. But when you grow in truth and when you grow in righteousness, your body can actually make you aware of things that are going wrong. How do we know? You, you, many of us probably can testify. You're sitting uh, many times in the center. Ah, there's something wrong with that. something wrong with that person. What? What's happening? My bodies give me indication that something's going on with that person that I probably need to stay away from. That hasn't happened while I'm here. So in case you're, sometimes people, so. Notice too that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are never in conflict with each other. That's how God created you to be. Your spirit, your mind, and your body were all supposed to be on one page. Thank God he died so we could do that. So your senses are not bad. You just can't be led by your senses. Please, you, you, you have no need to pray in the spirit when you leave the parking lot today. Just look both ways. Use your senses. Here's another one, constantly younger people. I love him. He doesn't have a job. You don't need to pray about it. <laughs> but the Lord told me, okay, if you want to take care of him the rest of your life, that's up to you. <laughs> so he gets quiet. These are just some common things we could do here. So we'll finish this here. How is the kingdom of God extended? You see a picture here in Genesis 2. God is always a source. He brings the animals to Adam. He's always the source of all things. But notice that God, some translations actually express this, that God watches to see what Adam would name them. And you'll notice that Adam does not stop to fast and pray about what to name those animals. There's a lot going on in those verses. I'm not suggesting I have a complete understanding, but I do know this. When you know someone, you can speak for them. When you know someone, you can speak for them. When you know someone, you can speak for them. Those animals do not know if it's God's voice or Adam's voice. They just know that's the word of God. And I'm supposed to follow the commands of that word in the earth. Paul would later write, creation longs and what groans for the appearing of the sons of God. Why? Because they know when they hear people operating correctly, they're supposed to respond to those voices. Notice the pattern again of the book of Genesis. God speaks, 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 God speaks. Now who's speaking? Adam is speaking. He's not a little God but he's made in the image of God, operating under God's governing authority and speaking words from God. How do we know those, those, those words were much more than just words? Because biblically speaking, when you name something, you help prophesy its characteristics. That's why everyone should know their name.
So the earth functions extending the kingdom of God when God's people live from a place of relationship, of being governed by his voice, and then acting on the truth that God has. Maybe we'll get into it tonight, but you'll see how that kind of gets disrupted when we start believing the wrong thing. But God gave us a kingdom. God didn't just give us a new nature. He gave us a new way. You were created to hear things from God that you've never heard before. Adam had never named animals before. What qualified Adam to name animals? God gave him governing authority. Yeah, rhinoceros, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Who would? Rhinoceros, yeah. And he definitely probably thought the cats were from hell, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was worried. He knew dog. That's why a dog became man's best friend. But at the cats, he was a little concerned. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you made that, God? <laughs> so, yeah, they don't care. They're not loving. They need inner healing. <laughs> yeah, all the, and all the cat lovers give me feedback. <laughs> yeah. We know these things. Yeah. But you'll, you'll see something that Adam when functioning correctly, he just simply trusted God. He simply trusted God. And the way he viewed God and Eve were perfectly in alignment. God gave us a new nature, but he also gave us a new way. And I believe that we're in a season in the earth and obviously, it doesn't go beyond the written word of God. That's our standard. But God wants to release understanding to his people that we have not known. And God's word to us is what qualifies us to do what God's called us to do. What, what qualifies me? What qualifies anyone to preach the gospel? To that be part of your purpose in the earth? It's not that hands were laid on me or they have a certificate. It's that God called me. God's word is what qualifies you to do what God called you to do. You could, you could be um, called to preach, but you also could be called to start a business. You could be called to start a school. You could be called to do whatever, God, but whatever he called you to do, it'll probably be impossible. I know it will be impossible without God's help. So I'll land... I land the plane with this story. I've been trying to land the plane for a while, but it's okay. No time limit. Yeah, just keep circling. Keep circling. I saw there's an airport not too far from here. Uh, I was in um, Switzerland, I think about three years ago, and uh, it was the first time I was there, and we were going to have a, a meeting, and people from different, not a big meeting, but people from different parts of Europe were coming. And a really close friend of mine was there with me on this trip and his wife, and he was going to help lead worship that night with the team. I like percussion. I like the box. I like. I just like messing around with it. I can't play it, but well, for the moment I can. And so I was playing the box and the meeting was about to start. And I don't play the box with the team, nor had they invited me, which is probably a good thing. And I heard the Lord say to me, I want you to play the box tonight. I said, Lord, I don't play the box. He said, I want you to play the box. I don't play the box, Lord. I don't play the box. So then he always gets me with this one. I thought you told me that you would do anything I asked you to do ever. Are you going to do what I asked you to do? Right, boss. Got it. So I start playing the box 
and singing. It's horrible. Probably the singing and the box, but more the box. And I said, God, this is not good. I'd like to be invited back to this country. And he said, I didn't tell you to sing. I just told you to play the box. That's what he told me. That's exactly what he told me. So I start playing the box. And it starts flowing, baby. I mean, it starts rolling. I'm not exaggerating any bit. I mean, God, the band follows me. It's really powerful. They still actually talk about that meeting that night of the things God broke through. There's a lot of leaders and just defined things for a lot of people. And they still remember how God ministered to people. And so after the meeting, I was there and the leader said, that was amazing. I said, yeah, I've never done that before. She said, oh, we thought you did it all the time, the way you were playing. So we just followed you. God will make you look smart. He will. You want to be smart, talk to God. I'm serious. You want to be wise at something, talk to God about it. Then sometimes he'll tell you, he's like, I didn't, I didn't ask you to do that. I asked him about certain things, and he said, I, I don't want you to mess with that. Okay. So my friend was there. He, he was a, a, actually telling these guys, he's a worship professor at Elam. He's done worship for years, tremendous worship leader. One of, you know, one of the signs of growing in maturity is the ability to be self-aware. So I wanted to ask him, you know, you don't want to make this up in your mind. I said, I said John, I think, that was awesome. I've never seen you do that before. I said, thank you, Jesus. He knows about worship. You know, somebody knows about worship. So I went back to my hotel room that night. We had to fly somewhere the next day. I was tired. Always learn from your experiences in God. Always inquire of the Lord. I've learned to ask God things. And I said to the Lord, I said, what was that all about? What, what, What are you trying to teach me? He goes, anything I tell you, you can do by faith. Anything I tell you, you can do by faith. So what qualified me to play the box that night? God told me I could. Some of you need to rethink some things that God has asked you to do because you don't think you're worthy. You know, sometimes too, when God asks us to do something, you know, he he knows who you are, right? (laughs) Like sometimes we don't think he knows us. Sometimes when he asks us to do stuff, he, uh, he knows what's going on on the inside of us. And he's actually, when he speaks things to us, he's trying to invite us into a place of healing in our hearts. Remember Moses? Born, lived in royalty, kills somebody, murders him on the backside of a desert, see the bush, God talks to him. I mean, people think they like prophecy. That was a good word. He goes, I'm the God who hears. I'm the God who answers. And by the way, you're going to be my spokesperson of deliverance. You're going to be on TBN, man. You got it. That wasn't his reaction. He's like, but I stutter. Yeah. What's happening? His own internal pain. His own insecurities are now still coming up. You know what I've learned? Faith is often what you believe God will do for you. Identity is what you believe God can do through you. So often, it's not like a bad thing. It's like a divine exchange. Why, why don't I think I can do this? What is the trauma that God wants to heal here? He did set you free. But often you've got to apply his healing power to walk out that freedom. Another mark of maturity is the ability to identify when you have trauma that needs to be healed. A religious spirit will tell you you're fine. 
I've been born again for years. I pray and tell you. That doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> right? Peter? Hearing the voice of God doesn't make you immature either. It just means you heard the voice of God. Peter, right? Peter, who do men say that I am? Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Who do you say that I am? Christ, the son of the living God. What does he do? Hits it out of the park, right? He's in Jesus Christ's school ministry. Hits it out. God! What does he say? You have revelation knowledge. This did not come from a soul or man. This is actually a true statement. Very next statement, because I've learned this is what's like walking with Jesus. 20, 26 years now, going after him. I'm still learning. He starts going, the son of man's going to suffer many things. See, he'll constantly say stuff to you that you need to adjust to. And he goes, and Peter's like, no, 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 Jesus. I heard the sermon, take up your sword, the kingdom of heaven suffer violent. This can't be. This can't be. What did Jesus tell him? One place he's like aligned with God. Other place who's he aligned with? This doesn't mean he's possessed. He's just saying, your thinking right here is demonic. You're thinking about revenge. You're thinking about a political kingdom. Your thinking's incorrect over here. So the truth is, we could be really strong in one area and really need some healing in another area. I know this biblically, and I know this working with leaders. And I just kind of laugh sometimes because I realize my own need for God, but also go there like, you don't understand, I got a healing ministry, I got a prophetic gift, I'm, like, I'm, I'm amazing. I said, I know you are, but you got some trauma that needs healing over here. That's all true. You're an amazing apostle, you're an amazing topper, you're awesome. All your partners love you, but your kids don't like you because you're not a good dad. So let's work on that. Lord, thank you. Hmm. If you just receive this word, why don't you just stand to your feet? <laughs>